I want to look at three or four texts. The first one I want to look at is quite long. And what I propose I do is I'm simply going to read through it. We'll put it up on the screen. It'll be on quite a few slides. I'm going to read through this text. And then I'll make some comments about it. And then I'll look at a couple of shorter texts. And then at the end, we can have a discussion. <coughs> if you feel really strongly that you want to uh, uh, um, chip in something along the way, then do feel free to. But it's probably best if we kind of hold the discussion to the end, because as in always these situations, it's like the next thing I was going to say will answer that question. So, um, but <coughs> either way, we'll, if it goes, it goes. Um, now, the first, the text I want to, to focus on, the longest text, is a story. So don't worry, there's nothing horrible technical philosophy. It's just a story. And it's a story in which someone quotes a passage from the discourses of Epictetus. Now, those of you that looked into this will know that Epictetus himself, the Stoic philosopher, wrote nothing, um, like his great hero Socrates, he wrote nothing. But we have a series of texts um, written by a pupil of his called Arian, the historian Arian. So we have Arian's discourses of Epictetus, which are his lecture notes from Epictetus' classroom. And um, the ancient sources say that Arian wrote eight books of discourses. But we've only got four. So at some point, the manuscript was in two volumes and volume two got lost. Um, so the, the quotation that we're going to look at in this first text is a quotation from book five of the discourses. <coughs> so a passage that's otherwise completely lost um, if it wasn't for this quotation. So I say that by way of background so we get to it. Get to that. Sense. Okay, the, 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 the text is by a guy called Aulus Gellius. Uh, he's writing in Latin, and he writes a book called The Attic Nights, and it's full of pieces of gossip and after-dinner stories that you might read in Athens in the evening after your dinner. So this isn't a big, serious philosophical text. This isn't Aristotle's metaphysics. This is gossipy stories that might be entertaining. So I'm hoping that that still stands today. I'm just going to read this whole... I'm going to read through the whole passage. Um... We were sailing from Cassiopeia to Brundisium over the Ionian Sea, violent, vast, and storm-tossed. During almost the whole of the night which followed our first day, a fierce side wind blew, which had filled our ship with water. Then afterwards, while we were all still lamenting and working hard with the pumps, the day at last dawned. But there was no less danger and no slackening of the violence of the wind. On the contrary, more frequent whirlwinds, a black sky, masses of fog, and kind of fearful cloud forms, which they call typhones or typhoons, seem to hang over and threaten us, ready to overwhelm the ship. In our company was an eminent philosopher of the Stoic sect, whom I had known at Athens as a man of no slight importance, holding the young men who were his pupils under very good control. I'm not sure what that means by that. <laughs> <laughs> In the midst of the great dangers of that time and that tumult of sea and sky, I looked for him, desiring to know in what state of mind he was and whether he was unterrified and courageous. <coughs> and then I beheld the man, frightened and ghastly pale, not indeed uttering any lamentations, as all the rest were doing, nor any outcries of that kind, but in his loss of colour and distracted expression, not differing much from the others." The stoic, ideal sage is, it seems, as terrified as everyone else. But when the sky cleared, the sea grew calm and the heat of danger cooled. Then the stoic was approached by a rich Greek from Asia, a man of elegant apparel, as we saw, and with an abundance of baggage and many attendants, while he himself showed signs of a luxurious person and disposition. This man, in a bantering tone, said, what does this mean, Sir Philosopher, that when we were in danger, you were afraid and turned pale, while I neither feared nor changed colour? And the Philosopher, after hesitating for a moment about the propriety of answering him, said, If in such a terrible storm I did show a little fear, you are not worthy to be told the reason for it. <laughs> but if you please... The famous Aristippus, a pupil of Socrates, shall answer for me, who on being asked on a similar occasion by a man much like you why he feared, though a philosopher, while his questioner on the contrary had no fear, replied that they had not the same motives, for his questioner 
need not be very anxious about the life of a worthless coxcomb, <laughs> for he himself feared for the life of an Aristippus. So the Stoic sage has no problem with sarcasm. Um, but also, it's worth noting, he has no problem with referring to philosophers from very different schools, because Aristippus is famous for being one of the first hedonists in Greek philosophy, whose philosophical position couldn't be further removed from Stoicism. But he still um, is happy to reference him as, a, as, another, as another wise individual. With these words, the Stoic writ himself for the rich Asiatic. But later, when we were approaching Brundisium and the sea and the sky were calm, I asked him what the reason for his fear was, which he had refused to reveal to the man who had improperly addressed him. And he quietly and courteously replied, Since you are desirous of knowing, hear what our forefathers, the founders of the Stoic sect, thought about that brief but inevitable and natural fear. Or rather, said he, read it. For if you read it, you will be the more ready to believe it, and you'll remember it better. Thereupon, before my eyes, he drew from his little bag the fifth book of the Discourses of the Philosopher Epictetus, which, as arranged by Arian, undoubtedly agree with the writings of Zeno and Chrysippus. So here we get to the, the meat of it. In that book, I read this statement, which, of course, was written in Greek. <laughs> and ours is writing this in Latin. The mental visions which the philosophers call fantasiae, or fantasies. Now, you can see fantasies is just a lazy attempt to translate fantasia. Um, and fantasy doesn't have the best English connotations. So we should tr translate that better with the word impressions. Okay? Um, the, um, the mental visions which the philosophers call impressions by which the mind of man, on the very first appearance of an object, is impelled to the perception of the object, are neither voluntary nor controlled by the will. Okay, so you have no control over your sense perceptions. The data comes at you from outside. You don't control them. Okay? You have no control over the impressions that your mind receives through the senses. But through a certain power of their own, they force their recognition upon us. Okay? We don't have any choice but to receive them. But the expressions of ascent, which they call synchatathesis, by which these visions are recognised, are voluntary and subject to man's will. Therefore, when some terrifying sound, either from heaven or from a falling building, or as a sudden announcement of some danger, or anything else of that kind occurs, even the mind of a wise man must necessarily be disturbed, must shrink and feel alarm not from a preconceived idea of any danger, but from certain swift and unexpected attacks which forestall the power of the mind and of reason. Presently, however, the wise man does not approve such impressions, that is to say, such terrifying mental visions. To quote the Greek, he does not consent to them nor confirm them, but he rejects and scorns them, nor does he see in them anything that ought to excite fear. And they say that there is this difference between the mind of a foolish man and that of a wise man. That the foolish man thinks that such visions are in fact as dreadful and terrifying as they appear at the original impact of them on his mind. And by his assent, he approves of such ideas as if they were rightly to be feared and confirms them. For prosepidoxadsai is the word which the Stoics use in their discourses on the subject. But the wise man, after having been affected for a short time, and slightly in his colour and expression, does not ascend, but retains the steadfastness and strength of the opinion which he has always had about visions of this kind, namely that they are in no wise to be feared, but excite terror by a false appearance and vain alarms. Last bit. Um, but these are the opinions and utterances of Epictetus, the philosopher, in accordance with the beliefs of the Stoics, I read in that book, which I've mentioned, and I thought that they ought to be recorded for this reason, that when things of the kind which I have named chance to occur, we may not think that to fear for a time, and as it were, turn white, is the mark of a foolish and weak man. But in that brief but natural impulse, we yield rather <coughs> to human weakness than because we believe that those things are what they seem. So, 
the first <coughs> movements that I was talking about this morning, these immediate kind of responses, natural responses that we have to certain um, events. <coughs> now, this I think is really the central idea that comes out of this text, but I want to unpack it a bit now. Um, the central idea is that although these first movements that affect the stoic wise person as much as anyone else are perfectly natural, it's a mistake to assent to them. It's fine to be flustered by a sudden occurrence, but the mistake <coughs> most people make, Epictetus is suggesting, is to make a judgment on the basis of that first feeling, that first response, rather than waiting for the immediate impact of the event to pass and then make a judgment calmly and rationally. So the mistake seems to be to rush to make a judgment too quickly. Now, this text is quite interesting for another reason, because the standard view of what's going on in this kind of process, um, the standard stoic view, is of a two-stage process. So the mind is presented by the mind is presented with an impression, and then you either accept it or reject it. Okay, there's an impression and then there's a sense. But that doesn't seem right for this case. This case seems to be a bit more complicated than that. Um, let me um, have a look. So in our example of the man on the boat in the storm, what we seem to have is an initial impression <coughs> there's a wave crashing down upon me. And then there's this first movement, this kind of physiological reaction, that the face turns pale. And that's just something that happens that's out of his control. Then it looks like there's a value judgment that's being made. We're all going to die. Um, and then the mind is presented with a second impression that combines the data you get from the senses and this very quick value judgment that you've made. There's a wave crashing down on me and we're all going to die. And then it's a sent to that second impression that generates a belief that something terrible is going to happen and then generates the passion or the emotion of fear. Now, the, kind of, the, the, kind of the normal story focuses on receiving an impression and then either assenting it or rejecting it. But the story we have here seems to suggest that something more complicates, complicated is going on. And it's this distinction between a first impression that simply presents some facts about the external world and then this second impression that includes some kind of value judgment. And that distinction looks to be key. It looks to be essential if we're going to understand what's happening in this story. Now, usual, uh, usual accounts of stoicism, I said, don't really emphasize that distinction. But it looks important, and Marcus Aurelius alludes to it too. Um, here's a passage from the Meditations. Um, Marcus says, do not say more to yourself than the first impressions report. You have been told that someone speaks ill of you. This is what you've been told. You've not been told that you're injured. I see the little child is ill. This is what I see. But that he's in danger? I don't see that. In this way, then, abide always by the first impressions and add nothing of your own from within. So the thought seems to be that we try and take a step back and simply focus on what's actually being presented to us through the through the senses, and ascend to that, but not to anything else. And because the Stoics are actually surprisingly modern in some ways, um, they have a, an entirely materialist conception of nature. Um, what exists are bodies, a matter in motion, governed by a series, of, uh, um, a series of laws of cause and effect. There's a causal nexus. And all of it's value-free in the way in which a scientist would, would, would think of it as being value-free. And what we want to do is just try and see just that, see what's presented in these first impressions without adding anything further. So, to go back to the first example, that the wave is crashing down upon us, we see, but that we're all going to die and don't see. Because, of course, we probably won't all die. And in this case, they didn't because they lived to tell the tale. Now, Marcus makes this sort of point in another text as well. Again, also from the meditations. Marcus says, 
Okay, this is a bit weird, okay? Let me read it and then we try and explain what I think it's actually saying. Um, See that the governing and sovereign part of your soul is undiverted by the smooth and broken movement in the flesh. But when they're diffused into the understanding by dint of that other sympathy, as needs must be in a united system, then you must not try to resist the sensation, which is natural, yet the governing part must not of itself add to the affection the judgment is good or bad. Okay, so smooth and broken movements of the flesh, I have backache, okay, which are diffused into the understanding by, need, by dint of sympathy, as needs must be a united system. I'm a unified organic entity, a mixture of mind and body. I mean, as the Stoics conceive it, literally a mixture of mind and body. My, my, my soul permeates my whole body, they, they suggest, in the way in which they describe it. Um, soul is a terrible translation for the Greek word I'm talking about, there, but let's not worry about that. So, because I'm a unified organic entity, a mixture of mind and body, then inevitably I will feel the backache. But I shouldn't resist that sensation because it's completely natural. Part of having a body is you have backache sometimes, you stub your toe. Yet the governing part must not of itself add anything to that affection. Okay, simply accept the experience as it is without adding a judgment whether this is something good or bad. So again, remain at the level of what we might call first impressions. And we also find that kind of idea in the last text that I want to introduce, and then we can open it up and have a discussion. The last text I want to introduce is from one of the surviving books of Epictetus' Discourses, in Book 3, and it's a chapter with the title, How Ought We to Exercise Ourselves to Deal with Impressions of the Senses? And... Um, Again, bits of it are obscure, I'll kind of unpack it as, I, uh, as we go. Um, as we exercise ourselves to meet the sophistical interrogations, remember this is a report of a, of a discussion in, a, in, a, in a, a school of philosophy, so the philosophy students exercise themselves to meet the sophistical er interrogations, the kind of, sort of logic oral exam or something, so we ought also to exercise ourselves daily to meet the impressions of our senses. Because these two put interrogations on us. So and so's son is dead. Answer? That lies outside the sphere of the moral purpose. It is not an evil. His father has disinherited so and so. What do you think of it? That lies outside the sphere of the moral purpose. It is not an evil. Caesar has condemned him. That lies outside the sphere of moral purpose. It is not an evil. I'll come back in a minute to what moral purpose means. These things are not evils. He was grieved at all of this. That does lie within the sphere of more purpose. It is evil. He has borne up under it manfully. That lies within the sphere of more purpose. That's a good. Now if we acquire this habit, we shall make progress. For we shall never give our assent to anything but that of which we get a convincing sense impression. His son is dead. What happened? His son is dead. Nothing else. His ship is lost. What happened? His ship is lost. He was carried off to prison. What happened? He was carried off to prison. But the observation he has fared ill is an addition that each man makes on his own responsibility. Okay. Now, so again, simply describing the events as it happens without adding any kind of adjunct. There's a very moral purpose Moral purpose translates a technical Greek term in Epictetus, prohiresis, which means something like your will, your judgment. Okay? Um, the faculty by which you make these value judgments that then create your beliefs and determine you know, how you live your life. So, the, and, and Epictetus suggests that this moral purpose, this prohiresis, is basically the only thing that's under your control. The only thing that you can control are your judgments, and it's this faculty. So, if I, go, if I go back, these things are outside the sphere of the moral purpose. They're external events. So, they're not evil. They're not good either, but they're not evil. These things are within the sphere of moral purpose. They are within the sphere of our judgments. So, he was grieved at all this. As someone picked up in the earlier session, 
Um, but the arguments about translation, grief might not be the best word here. Let me translate that something like, he was inconsolable at this. There was a kind of excessive grief, an excessive reaction. He was inconsolable at this. This lies within the sphere of moral purpose. That is to say, it was the product of a value judgment that he made. And it's evil. It's evil because it's genuinely bad. It's genuinely bad because if the only thing that's really good is having an excellent, healthy state of mind, then this kind of excessive, rational disturbance, like inconsolable grief, upsets the state of your mind. And that's a really bad thing. And then again, he's born up under it manfully. That lies within the sphere of moral purpose. And it's a good. It's an expression of the individual's virtue and good character. <coughs> So, how do we avoid these value judgments that both Epictetus and Marcus really suggest we ought to um, we ought to stop doing? Well, what Epictetus seems to be suggesting is that we exercise or train ourselves to pay attention to what's actually presented to us in our perceptions, and to train ourselves to be able to pay attention to what it is we're adding to those perceptions. So we can draw a distinction between what's given as fact, if you like, and, and, and what we're adding ourselves. And we might say part of the aim here is to give a purely dispassionate, descriptive account of what we experience, one that doesn't involve any value judgments whatsoever. And sometimes that's described as adopting the perspective of physics, the kind of dispassionate physicist who simply describes the natural world as he sees it, rather than making any evaluative claims about any of the processes that he sees. And in the ancient schools, in, in Stoicism in particular, we often hear people suggesting that we cultivate the perspective of physics. This is why the Stoic philosopher ought to study natural philosophy and understand nature, because by doing that, we develop this more impersonal, dispassionate understanding of natural processes, which can help us um, um, avoid making these excessive value judgments. Okay, so I think that's kind of more or less everything I want to sort of put on the table. So, questions, yes? I think this is going to be a question, but what I'm sitting with is the question around meaning, and meaning making, and where that fits within a stoic Approach because if we are staying with, with, a, with a recognition of the first impression, for example, like the waves crashed over us, and, and that's how do we then move into making meaning of that experience in terms of our, our values, how we are in the world, or is that not a concern for stoicism? So, what do you mean by? <laughs> well, for me, like it matters to me, I guess, to know what that means for me. What does it mean for me to be standing on a boat and waves crashing over me? Which brings the second impression. She wants one. <laughs> yeah, I mean. But how do we? I guess I'm. Does, does it mean anything? Maybe it's just quite, happening. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. But I can't yeah. quite. I guess I'm struggling with the notion of moving through the world without concern for meaning or meaning making. Yeah. And that's my own kind of sure. bi biased <laughs> position. Yeah, sure. But I can't reconcile it with. Okay. Does, does that matter for a Stoic or I, I mean, okay, so Stoicism is a deeply paradoxical, if not to say schizophrenic philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, they're thoroughgoing materialists committed to naturalistic, reductive explanations of the processes in nature, governed by cause and effect. It all looks very scientific, it all looks very naturalistic. That's really there. At the same time, nature is identified with God, and everything happens as part of his providential ordering of nature according to perfect rationality, and it couldn't possibly be different than it is, not just because it's fixed by necessity, but because God has designed it to be the best of all possible worlds, and it couldn't be different. Both of those things exist in the ancient evidence. Okay? Now, which one of those... There are various ways in which you might try and interpret this. You might say one of those is what they really thought, and they didn't really believe the other, or you might try and kind of sort of embrace the paradox. So if you want a kind of sort of 
meaning-laden Stoicism, then you go down the theological line and you'd say, this was all part of the divine plan of the best possible world. Everything has meaning. It's all part of this um, providential ordering within nature. Now, that's not so attractive to most modern readers of Stoicism, but it's an element that was within the system. Um, Seneca has some very interesting stuff to say in his essay on providence, where he connects those kind of very theological thoughts with um, this kind of practical training, and he says, well, every time you face adversity, this is God sending a test for you, and it's your chance to step up to the mark or fail. And so every single event is invested with meaning because it's a test for you to see if you can be virtuous or not. So we could read this in a way that very, very meaning-laden if we wanted to. Um, and in fact, and, you, know, you could argue that, that we ought to because that's very much there within the ancient evidence. Um, I'll, 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 lots of hands now. Let me just say one, little, one last bit on that. Um, my, my own view, I mean, I'm tempted to read it in a slightly more naturalistic way. I'm very, very conscious that that might be deeply anachronistic and trying to make them look more modern than they really were. However, one of the things that the Stoics were famous for in antiquity was giving allegorical interpretations of ancient religions um, by reducing them to physical processes. And that suggests to me that some of the religious language may just be lip service because that's what they were expected to do, or that would make it more palatable for a wider audience. But I, you know, the, um, I, I, I don't have a firm view either way. Um, it's complicated. Right, lots of hands. Uh, yes? Um, one of the four components of the virtue was um, justice. How does value judgments feed into justice? I mean, is it can't be purely evidence-based all the time, the justice as the Stoics saw it, can it? Sure, sure. So, how might you try to define just and unjust behaviour? Um, well, you might try to define it as behaviour that is conducive or unconducive to well-functioning social relationships. And you might say that insofar as humans are naturally social animals, then a good human being, a uh, 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 discussion I had with someone earlier, a good human being in a non-moral sense, yeah, if humans are naturally social animals, will be one that interacts well with the other people around them. Because that's what it means to be a human being. And a good one will be one that does that well. If someone who acts unjustly and antisocially in all sorts of other ways will have failed to be a good human being in a non-moral sense because they won't be exhibiting the characteristics that are essential to what it means to be a human. So that would be a way in which we might try and give a kind of... Inform our judgments. That would be a way in which we inform our judgments mm. of people. Yeah. And that's also a way in which in which an, uh, uh, an excellent human being, a, a virtuous human being, is going to act well towards other people, simply because that's what it means to be a good person. People are social animals. That's part of what it means to be one. If you, if you, don't, if you don't get that, you fail to understand what it is that you are. That kind of thought. Mm -hmm. And that's something they share with Aristotle, by the way. There's some common ground there. Um, what would a stoic think about a gut reaction? So if you meet somebody and they haven't said anything, but you have a gut reaction, I don't like this person, I don't feel very safe. What would they, how would they interpret that? Um... I suppose, I suppose you'd have to think about that gut reaction along the lines that we've been talking about here, whether it's just some kind of immediate first impression. Uh, I mean, I take it, if it's a gut, if, 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 it's, if, if it's the sort that you don't like them, then that is obviously, that involves a value judgment, doesn't it? No, not necessarily. It might just be a feeling I don't feel safe, but you haven't done anything, it's just yeah. a feeling. So, I mean, this, yeah, I mean, so that's a really good example of, of why you need to step back and think, okay, why am I feeling this way? Have I made some value judgment, to, value yeah. judgment that I don't like this person? Is, is that what's going on? Do I just feel threatened? Is this just an expression of my natural instinct for self-preservation, yeah. yeah. that this person seems aggressive in some way? Um, is it that they remind you of someone else that you had very bad experiences with? That, that kind of, yeah. you know, rather... It's not always that, is it? It can just no, no. be something really um, unknown. It's not always transference or... Um, no, 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 but um, 
I think that, that would be that would be their suggestion. That's that's what you do. You try and analyse it as much as you, as much as you could, and see um, uh, what was the source of that value judgment and whether whether it was warranted or not. Um, yeah. Uh, could you um, put a little bit more meat on the bone as to what Epictetus means by something being within the sphere of moral purpose or not within the sphere of moral purpose? Yeah. What does he mean by moral purpose? So moral purpose means something like your, your will, your ability to judge. So the value judgments that I make are within the sphere of my moral purpose. Think of, if you, if you translate moral purpose as faculty of judgment, okay, um, my emotions are within the sphere of my faculty of judgment because they're produced by my faculty of judgment. Um, my, my virtuous behaviour or not is also within that sphere, um, but external events are not within that sphere. Um, and and Epictetus will say that actually our, moral, our, our faculty of judgment is the only thing that we have any real control over, and so that's the thing that we ought to be devoting all of our attention to, because that's the thing that we can actually um, change. Um, yeah. I can, I can understand that you know, we, we look at the situation and we should just say what it is without adding bits on a bit dramatic. But then at the same time, when you say you've fallen up hundred man for me, haven't you made a value judgment there by saying that he was good? I mean, is it okay to have positive? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Nothing, nothing okay. negative. Absolutely. So, so, so this is good. <laughs> this is good because it's an expression of virtue. And virtue is the only thing that they suggest has any real value. Having a good character. So that's really good if you're displaying good character. Being overwhelmed by inconsolable grief is genuinely really, really bad because it's this excessive, irrational movement within your soul that destroys your good character. In, given that the good character isn't just about acting well, it's also about being a rational agent. So, um, so that's really, really bad because it's undermining the one thing that you've already worked out is, is key to uh, living a good life, being a good human being, and, uh, and, and being happy. It's an interesting example, though, isn't it, in terms of what is, um, what is virtuous. So uh, if something terrible has happened and you're very, um, you bear it well, that might not be a very good thing for you or for other people. Um, so it's that kind of idea about um, it's subjective sometimes what, uh, what a good way or a virtuous way to, um, to approach something is. And what looks like a positive, so it's good because it's a positive, is it positive? There might be more than one. Sure, view. sure. I mean, I suppose ultimately the idea that has worked behind all of this is the thing that really matters is intention rather than outcome. So if the intention is correct, that's what really matters. Uh, the outcome is less significant, ultimately, because the outcome is out of our control. Um, but if it's done with the right intention, um, uh, then, um, yeah. Lots more hands. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but in reality, doesn't both exist, negative and positive? And if we haven't got positive, how can we judge it's negative? Yeah. And if it's negative, how can we... If if there is only negativity, how can we all see positivity? Well, there's plenty of positivity here too, right? Yes, but both exist at the same, has to exist at the same time okay. for us to distinguish. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So it's neither good nor bad. <laughs> Which? It exists. Which is... it's, it's part of life. It's part of, I think, the basic of life. Yes. Uh, I've just been talking about the loss of fun. Yes. You know, and yeah. to describe inconsolable grief with <coughs> people in that context, I think, is a judgment in itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. So, so I mean, evil is a translation of a Greek word kakon, which we could translate bad. Evil kind of sounds a bit grandiose. Okay, it's so, bad. it's bad. Um, I, would, I would argue that, I mean, I think that's not really bad. Yeah, sure, sure. But, it's and, out of control grief. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is why I, I've lost the translation. So, you know, a parent that loses a child and has a natural emotional 
a, a natural response to that, I think, would fall under what the Stoics talk about, care and concern, their natural instinct um, uh, towards other people. That would be perfectly natural and normal, and it's what you'd expect. And if someone didn't, you'd think there was something wrong with them, right? So a natural grief response in that sense seems to be perfectly fine for the Stoics. But an inconsolable um, grief that's run out of control, so that you're unable to pull yourself back from it, the person that collapses in the corner wailing unconsolably to the point they can't function, that's what we want to avoid. So it's not a kind of sort of stony-faced, I'm indifferent to this also, whatsoever, you know, a, a natural grieving response you'd expect. But if it's kind of inconsolable, out of control, excessively irrational response, that's the thing to avoid. I think ultimately this is a translation problem, as I was saying this morning. Um, the word that you use in grief here is translating a technical term that is a, a particular type of emotion within a complex classification that all have specific definitions. And the English word grief obviously has a much wider connotation. Yeah, as does the term norm. You know, so you need to look at that in the tool in terms of time or in general, whatever. You know, so what's normal for one group of people is not normal for another. Um, so that's what I was trying to say. Um, you know, so what's normal for one group of people is not normal for another. Um, my daughter would probably think they're very different ways to her, but it's kind of what she's still thinking. You know, it's a problem. Sure. To a, to a, to a, well, what the, what the Stoics want to suggest, and this is something that they shared very much with Aristotle, there's a common ground here is that human beings are by nature social, and they're by nature rational. And, and that's going to be cross-cultural. And a good human being is going to be one that displays those characteristics of sociability and rationality. Now, you might not like that as a definition of what a human being is. You might you know, want to suggest something else. But that's how they want to define a human being. So a good human being is going to be one that displays those traits. And, that will be, and, and that, that's a universal claim. So, but yeah, lots more so, hands, yes. Just in the middle of that sort of being excessive, really, and then making a judgment about excessive behaviour. So what would be their view about um, um, a martyr who dies for the cause of justice, yeah. since justice is a virtue? It's yeah. a very simple thing, okay? Yeah. Would it be that they are excessive and therefore they're not virtuous, in fact? No, no, Stoics are big into martyrdom. Right. Oh, really? The Stoics, oh, okay. the, 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 Stoics, the Stoics are famous for killing themselves. Yeah. Stoic, su <laughs> Stoic suicides are uh, commonplace. Um, I don't, you know, try not to push that too hard. Don't want to take any risk. Don't try this at home, kids. But, but seriously, so, really, there should be more of a Christian in there. Kind of well, appreciation. <laughs> so, you know, the great, you know, the, 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 the Stoics are quite explicit that they're admirers of Socrates. Socrates' decision to drink the hemlock in trial rather than escape, which he could have very easily, because, you know, even in 399 BC, the Athenians weren't so out of touch to think that it was good practice to execute an 8 year old Even then, that wasn't a done thing. They were quite happy to let him escape. But he refused to, because to do so would be to go against some very firmly held principles that would compromise his virtue and would destroy the one thing that's most important to him, his excellent character. And his excellent character is more valuable than his continued biological existence. And, and that's, that's key. So, and in, in Rome in the first century AD, there was a famous stoic opposition to the emperor. These people engaged in politics, they were very active, a number of them were you know, exiled or committed suicide rather than compromise their principles. The most famous example of this a little bit earlier is Cato the Younger, who stands up to Julius Caesar and commit suicide rather than submit to the rule of Julius Caesar because he thinks that that would be a compromise of his virtues. So Stoics killed themselves left, right and centre yeah. for the sake of the most important thing, which is preserving their rational character. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, on all this, I think the, the, the goal is to, yeah, as you say, to avoid losing your virtue. Um, but from, from the other point of view, and I think in one of the discussions came, I mean, are they not tolerant for people that have lost virtue? Because, you know, there is a reason for everyone's evil behavior. So, you know, for you to do good is a good thing. But for you to judge that the other person has lost virtue is yeah. not necessarily good. So how do they... Yes, absolutely. That's very good. And it connects with this thing about, you know, we, we've talked in this example about not making value judgments about particular situations, but we might also talk about not making value judgments about other people and their good or bad behavior. 
And this is which he's making though in this in this yeah. thing about the rich guy, right? He's he's he matching him. He's like, he oh, makes, you are. He, right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He makes a sarcastic yeah. comment. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, I mean, that's another point where the Stoics are very much followers of Socrates, who famously says that all wrongdoing is the product of ignorance. Everyone pursues what they think is the best um, path. Um, but not everyone knows what the best path is, so they go horribly wrong and do all sorts of terrible things. Uh, and that's where the philosophy comes in, because if you can show them that the values that they're holding are confused, inconsistent... Um, you're tolerant, the way they're tolerant yeah, about absolutely, others. Absolutely, yeah, because yeah. all wrongdoing is ultimately um, um, involuntary. So yeah, very, very tolerant in that sense. Tolerant, but trying to influence... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to that? Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that this uh, position uh, to avoid um, our value judgment is uh, uh, pretty suspicious. I mean, uh, some sort of uh, privileges uh, the positions, some sort of uh, last uh, word, because uh, these positions uh, are already included um, uh, value judgment. Uh, I mean, uh, this position uh, in itself uh, to avoid uh, value uh, judgment is already uh, value judgment. So it's some sort of uh, circle here, and um, what, what, what do you think about that? I, I mean, it's a, a, a contradictive uh, imperative, uh, not uh, okay, okay. What, what, I, what, what, I, yeah. what I'm doing. Okay, so yes? this what is that? not an imperative. No one's telling you what to do. This is not moralizing in that sense of moralizing, okay? To get technical, it's what Kant would call a hypothetical imperative rather than a categorical imperative, which means that the whole thing is prefaced by an if. If you want to lead a good, happy life, we think we know the way to do it. And if you want to do it, we suggest you do all of this. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think someone else can offer you a better, um, set of advice to lead a happy life, then pursue that and see if it works for you. If you don't want to live a happy life, if you're just happy being miserable, then <laughs> we have nothing to say to you, and we cannot convince you that you ought to want to live a good life, but we think this works. There's only one way in which you know that that's a, a convincing claim, and that's to try it out. And that's the idea behind the whole Stoic Week experiment. Try it out. Does it actually work? But there's no moral ought in any of this at all. We think this will get you to living the happy life, which we're convinced that all human beings ultimately want. So we think we've got something to say, but we think we offer some arguments that are convincing. We think we offer a set of arguments that show that externals don't have any inherent value and that virtue is the only thing that really does. Now... You know, you either, you either think those arguments work as philosophical arguments, or you think they don't, and you might have objections, and that's a kind of live philosophical debate. Does the philosophy work? But they think they can give you dispassionate philosophical arguments as to why this will work. Um, and then there's the kind of practical experimental element that we're doing in Stone Week. Does it actually generate a sense of well-being in people? Um, but... If you don't want to be happy, or you don't buy the arguments, walk away. I mean, that's you know, literally. I mean, that that's that, that's really the view. So, so I, I mean, I think that's, that's sort of quite important. I mean, the sort of modern notion of m morality. I think, I think this applies to other ancient philosophical philosophical schools as well, not just the Stoics. Doesn't really apply in quite that same way. <coughs> yeah. Um, I think there's a danger because we're, we're trying to talk about it, bringing this into the modern day. You didn't say how the Stoics. Would we say you, you, you couch the, the talk um, value, ju value judgments and how to avoid them as, as a current? Um, but the trouble is, when we're talking about something that happened that long ago and we've progressed, it can slip into dogma. Because if you're saying you can never have a second impression, then when you get the chest pain, you don't call the ambulance because you don't think I might be having a heart attack. Well, no, that's not what, that's, that's not what I meant by second impression. The first impression is I have a chest pain. So yeah. I have a chest pain. Yes. So, I mustn't therefore think, if I'm going to add my own fears, I, maybe I'm having a heart attack, and therefore I must act. I must wait and see what happens if you follow that. If, because we've progressed, so we have more knowledge now, perhaps. I'm not convinced that that has, that that's a real concern here. So, 
you could, you know, you could make a, a very dispassionate, you know, I have a chest pain, I know how the human body works, I know that might be a signal for something else not being right, I know that I might want to get that checked out. I mean, because I have a natural instinct for self-preservation. No, but you also have knowledge, because we've been told. Yeah, but, yeah, but that doesn't, I don't think that, that offers any objection to this as such. What you ought not to do, they're suggesting, is become so inconsolable the first chest pain that you think the whole world's going to end, because that's a, an unhelpful, debilitating response. Well, neither of them are helpful. The point is that you should be able to do both dispassionately. Well, there, there is a distinction there, though. So you, you have a chest pain, and you think it could be due to a heart attack, therefore I'll act on it, versus I've got a chest pain, I'm going to die. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that you hurt me, but you have to say, uh, if I'm going to be a stoic, then I, must, I mustn't have a, add my own other knowledge, which I must just act on the fact that I have a chest pain. It, it, it's talking there about a, a value judgment on that first impression, exactly. point, rather than an evaluation, which is you can kind of find a cause for the chest pain by suggesting that perhaps it's a heart attack. Yeah. You do have a second impression, though. You have a second impression of the chest pain. You're not saying, I just have a chest pain. You've added something to it, which is yeah. important. Well, that, that, that's fine, but that's different from adding a value judgment. So I think we're okay on this. I think we're okay. yeah. It seems that Aristotle would say that uh, impressions can be changed by uh, teaching virtues. Actually, that humans can be trained to have different first impressions. And that's how somebody can become more virtuous. And somebody's courageous, for example, the person uh, feels fear in the right, uh, to the right extent, at the right situation, and for right reasons. So that even the first impression is changed. Mm. So what are the reasons why Stoics wouldn't accept mm. the possibility of mm. changing the first impressions? So we don't Change have double judgment because for many actions and mental responses, we just don't have time. And from what we know about the human uh, workings of human mind and body, we know that many uh, actually actions and, and uh, reactions are subconscious. So basically, language okay, so, position. And, yeah. uh, so this is a good point, and it came up in the earlier session as well. So I suppose the way the way to respond to it is to say this, that this kind of stopping and analysing and thinking through what's going on, paying attention to what you're actually experiencing and what you're adding yourself, this is kind of sort of remedial activity. This is kind of something that the person has to do as they go through a process of trying to um, fix themselves. But the idea, ultimately, is to then develop a new set of good habits based on the appropriate set of values, so that then you act immediately and instinctively, if, you, if we want to use that word, um, but quickly, without the kind of sort of, you know, convoluted set of steps. Um, but according to a new set of values, having, if you like, um, got rid of one's old bad habits and reprogrammed oneself. So there's that kind of thought. So that's why we get this constant emphasis on exercise and training in the Stoic philosophers, and why in the handbook you see these, um, in, in our handbook, um, the things we've drawn on often talk about the repetition of exercises so that you can inculcate those new habits. So then, as you say, it becomes a reflex response, but it becomes the right reflex response. One that you've thought through, and although you might not be consciously going through the whole process at the time, you know that the reflex response you're making is on firm foundations because you have at some point sat down and thought it through. So that kind of, of thought. Yeah. Um, how does the philosophy work with the modern with the modern religions? Yeah. <laughs> that's such a big... big I've got the same reaction. It's, wow. it's a huge... It's a huge... It's a huge but with any religion. Um, with your own religion. Uh, my, because because you you're not mentioning Greek. much the religion on this. Okay, okay so... Not the ancient Greek belief, yeah, but sure. the modern yeah. ones, the like, um, yeah, Christianity, Islam... Okay. Let me, let me, let, let me attempt <laughs> to... <laughs> so... Um, a, good fr a good friend of ours, of the project, who spoke at the equivalent event of this last year, a guy called Mark Vernon, is very interested in Stoicism and very interested in Christianity, and he thinks that all the best bits of Stoicism were taken up by Christianity <laughs> and are already there. So if you're a Christian, you get the best bits already. That's his view. Um, I don't buy that. 
Um, but it is true that Stoicism was a big influence on the development of early Christian thinking, not just early Christian morals, um, but also um, um, you know, sort of more complex metaphysical things, the idea of Holy Spirit, that there's some kind of animating spirit um, um, is also an idea that's taken from Stoicism. So there, there's, there's a very complex historical story about lots of influences. So there, there's certainly um, an influence there, a certain amount of overlap in ethics, but obviously very, very different metaphysics. Um, lots of people point to parallels between this and Buddhism. This is something that comes up again and again and again. Some people have pointed to parallels between Stoicism and Theravada Buddhism. Some people have pointed to parallels between Stoicism and Zen Buddhism. And a few people have made some suggestive remarks on this, but no one's <coughs> really done the hard work to, pack, to, 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 to unpack things and really look at the parallels in detail. And um, obviously for certain forms of Indian Buddhism, there's a whole metaphysical framework that doesn't look like it's compatible with Stoicism. But for something like Zen Buddhism that doesn't have that, it might be more compatible. But yeah, there's a lot of work still to be done to, to see that. Um, as for Islam, um, I can't comment. Um, okay, how are we doing? We've got a couple of minutes left. I'll take one more if there's one more. Um, but otherwise, we should head over to the main hall for the next bit. Uh, all done? One, okay, one more there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm interested uh, in, uh, about um, some sort of uh, um, Stoic's uh, unconscious practice. Uh, isn't it uh, such a term for them or, or not? Um, not, not? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, this kind of discussion of sort of making value judgments so quickly you don't even notice them is about the nearest that we find, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.